Thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Luca Bergonzi and I will be moderating this session about uh, TPS e-calls, uh, TPS service provider as a matter of fact. As you know, uh, they have been here for a very long time, but the, the topic of around uh, third party service providers <clears throat> basically sprouted out from the ground heavily when uh, e-call was introduced. And, but today we're going to see what are, what are the differences between you know, public services, the approach of private providers, uh, and so on. So we are <clears throat> having three guests. Karen Marcus is our first uh, speaker. Then we have Ronnie Riedel and Anna Tisten. So I will leave the floor to Karen. Thank you, Luca. Thank you and good afternoon, folks. Um, as he mentioned, my name is Karen Marquez and I'm going to grab the uh, little device here real quick so I can introduce myself a bit. Um, on this QR code, you can connect with me on LinkedIn and receive my contact information if you would like to follow up after the session. Uh, my background and experience for those that were not in the session yesterday with me is 21 years in 911 in the United States in emergency services from call taker, dispatcher, always working with all disciplines from police, fire, EMS, and emergency management as well before I came over to the private sector. Um, this is a very interesting topic when you're talking about third party types of data or service providers. And so I'm going to talk just a little bit about types of data that could be utilized within emergency services during a 112 or emergency call, emergency request, but also how do we operationalize that information and what is the end user experience as well and what is in it for that end consumer. So first of all, we want to make intelligent uh, decisions out of information that is provided via third-party service providers. So let's break down what kind of information comes from these providers. It could be location information, which foundationally is needed for an emergency request, whether that's an emergency request that's made automatically from a device, um, or it is a manual request, uh, as in a phone call. So we talked yesterday a little bit about all of the different types of providers. And, and I asked folks to raise their hand if they were wearing a wearable device. So I'm going to ask you to do the same. Who here is wearing a smart device on their person? Many of you, right? And you probably all have a phone with information on your device as well. So when we have an emergency that occurs, typically we're going to run to a phone and make a voice call. But what happens in the event that you cannot make a voice call? Something can actually make that request for service on your behalf. So we really need to understand uh, the workflows that are needed. When should emergency services be initiated first? And when should you introduce a third-party service provider? provider like a monitoring center first. Um, so it could be a wearable device that detects a fall or some sort of a crash that signals an emergency that can send that life-saving information through a platform into public safety's hands. And you want that to happen because that is going to be best for that end consumer who may not be able to speak on their own behalf. When that occurs, you also want to make sure that you're working with these third-party service providers to ensure that you're receiving the data at the right time, but who has the authority to view that information and how do they use that information? So within country, in a province, in a region, you want to make sure that you're following the proper legislation first and foremost and ensuring data, data privacy and protection for that end user. Um, there are sometimes bad actors that may utilize data in the wrong way, uh, so we want to make sure that information really is held as confidential during an emergency request for service. Uh, Third-party service information can also be from a connected vehicle. When a crash occurs, sensors in that vehicle can tell you not only about that emergency, but can also indicate for you what happened when this emergency occurred. Now, if someone can make an emergency call to 112, that's fantastic. You're going to ask a lot of questions. But typically, when someone is involved in an incident like that, you tend to be a little bit agitated. You might be in a panic mode. And you might not know what direction of travel you're facing. You may forget information that you normally would have known if you were in a normal situation. So that vehicle can now tell the direction of travel, the impact, whether airbags were deployed. I think I've been hearing a lot about the e-call system, but there's more data that can also be provided 
by the device itself through a platform to emergency services. And then how do we use that information? We make decisions off of understanding, is this an electric vehicle? Is it a gas-powered vehicle? In an electric vehicle response for fire folks in the room, how many fire folks are in here? That response is going to be very different. There's different tools that you need. You're not going to apply the same type of um, devices or, or services to an electric vehicle as you are to a gas-powered vehicle. Um, you may need additional resources. Perhaps I have a rollover and I have fluids leaking and I know that there were four parties in this vehicle versus just one. Am I going to need multiple medic units? Do I need to elevate that uh, request for service and send more than one ladder truck or engine. Uh, and then, not sure if you use blocking units here, but sometimes you'll send an additional unit to block traffic to keep scene safety. So all of this information and this data, we can make intelligent into the hands of the field responders and, and the emergency telecommunicator so that they're driving the proper decision ultimately to help save life ultimately to improve that response time, ultimately to help improve that call processing time so that we are creating an efficient response for that person that is in need and that's in an emergency. Then we go to smartphones and applications. From your smart device, you can make an emergency call for service, but there are countries that I have learned this week that have apps for that. Um, and so there is an app for essentially anything that you may want to do, whether it's an app to call emergency services or to just do your job. If you're a rideshare driver or a rideshare user, there may be a workflow for you that in the case of an emergency, you can push a panic button. But what is that panic button going to do? It is going to alert emergency services with the location, the vehicle make, model, color, license plate, and if that vehicle is moving, direction of travel information as well. That is critical information because that telecommunicator receives a voice call, asks a series of questions, and the person on the other end, again, may not always have that information immediately available. So streamlining the first part of this piece for the caller is grabbing that information and utilizing it to improve your call process. And then you take that information, now you have actionable data to give to your field responders so that police, fire, EMS immediately know, as soon as that information is put into the CAD system, what kind of car they're looking for, what is the color of that vehicle. Sometimes you have to wait for that information as the call interrogation process happens. So this is how that third-party data is valuable. Yesterday, I also talked about other apps for things like uh, delivery services. Um, there's a delivery service here I noticed that you can order from a restaurant. They go and pick it up and they'll deliver that to you on a bicycle or, or maybe in a vehicle. A person may not feel comfortable delivering food or services or goods to an area. And for those situations, emergency services is not needed. There's not an emergency but they need somebody to be on the line with them while they're making this delivery to give them that sense of security, sense of safety. That's why a lot of these tools and technologies are actually developed, right? We want to give people a sense of safety. So we can insert a third-party service provider like a monitoring center who can communicate with that caller, and if an emergency doesn't occur, they have that sense of security, someone was with them on the phone, they deliver their goods or service, they leave, emergency services is never notified. But in the case of an emergency, and when that occurs, the ability to change that workflow from I don't feel comfortable to now I'm having an emergency can be triggered by a single button. Emergency services is notified. That call gets routed to the appropriate emergency call center or control center. And now you have data about that delivery service person, whether it's a bicycle, a vehicle, that information can be delivered to improve that call flow. As I said, a lot of these different providers create tools and technologies because ultimately they are selling a sense of safety. 
And I think every one of us knowing in, in the world that we're living in today, we want to have that sense of security and safety, whether we're in our home, in our vehicle, we're traveling abroad. We want to know that we can be safe wherever we go. And the tools that we have within our person or on our body or what we're driving in or where we're staying can provide those emergency services as immediately as possible. We also want to improve that experience for not only the caller, but the call taker. So I just mentioned several different types of data sources. Those data sources traditionally would have to work independently with you, come in, knock on the door, make a phone call to connect to your different systems. So I mentioned rideshare, vehicle telematics, connected building, apps, phone calls. That's just five five different types of connections for just a few that I mentioned. What we can do is now bring it in through a single platform to aggregate all of that information so that regardless of what is on the other end of the line when that telecommunicator receives that emergency request from wherever they receive it from, voice call, vehicle, or other, they have the data accessible to them and they don't have to worry about what system am I, am I going to go into to look for this information. It presents for them when that call comes in. Um, the other piece of that is wanting to make sure that we understand when somebody cannot speak for themselves, how does that telecommunicator experience bring that data in so that the, tel the technology can communicate for them as well? So you create that visual, that user experience, UI, UX, that can intelligently show data, whether it's location information with a map pin, and it shows the movement of that vehicle or that person, or contextually prioritizes critical life-saving data first, and other information can follow in that supplemental card. So not only creating a user experience for the end user, but also for the telecommunicator. That also will help streamline their workflow so they get the right data into the hands of the field responders as quickly as possible. And then if the next slide changes, there we go. I was asked in this session to really talk about what is the impact to the caller? You know, we talk a lot about technologies improving um, services for the field responders, police, fire, EMS, telecommunicators. So I'm going to tell the so what piece of this in the stories that we receive from the end users themselves. So here were three times that additional data saved a life. An elderly man's Apple Health app saved his life in Kirkwood, Missouri. Now these are stories that are coming from the US, but it would be no different than the impact that could be had within the, your countries here. That rich additional data in prov provided police, fire, and EMS dispatched to the accurate location. The caller's son was notified the accurate medical history because that medical information was available during that phone call, and we connected the loved one to emergency services so that they can reunite with their family immediately. You have another one here of an Apple Watch alerted uh, 911 of a hard fall. I've heard many times that fall detection in these different devices really has helped save lives. And so, um, you know, when that emergency event is triggered, if the telecommunicator knows that it's a fall, you're going to handle that call a little bit differently. You may have standard operating procedures that say, if no one is on the phone, there's no voice connection, you may try to see if this person is deaf or hard of hearing through a service like a TTY. And if no one's on the phone with no data available, you may enter a call for service in CAD. Somebody may be dispatched at some point in time. But oftentimes what happens is if you cannot reach somebody that you think is called for emergency services, no responders ever sent. This type of data can at least ensure that someone is sent to the location where these uh, informations were triggered so that you can at least do a welfare check and ensure that there was no one that was deceased or needed additional services. So um, that data is really critical. And then, of course, here's a ride share story. And that's the so what that's in it for that end user, that consumer, that not only are we selling them a sense of security and safety, but when it comes time and that emergency occurs, and it's needed the most, it actually works. And it's actually used. And somebody sees it, units are sent, lives are saved. 
Here's a story of a kidnapping that happened in one of the states in the United States, uh, where they received an emergency call from a distraught female who claimed that she had been kidnapped and she was held in the abductor's basement for seven to ten days. She had no idea where she was, but managed to steal the abductor's cell phone and call for emergency services. The information that was provided from the wireless carrier narrowed it down to an area an address range, but when they plugged that phone number into um, the Rapid SOS application, they were able to see that map pin send directly to the house, and they were able to rescue the female. That is what is the reason that we do what we do for that end user and why that third-party information is so critical to save lives. Here's another one where it was a boat in distress. Having that accurate location to provide to field responders, not only that are on a street or you know, on a highway, but also how it can help with water rescues. And as those waves start to move and you see that direction of travel, you can understand how that boat is being carried and the motion of which that caller is in so that you can send appropriate resources, your marine units, um, to help save that life as well. So Karen, working with control rooms, yes, we Luca. We have to come to, we have to close it up. Okay. This is my Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Working with Peace Apps, <laughs> A, it's creating awareness. Yesterday I saw this slide um, that awareness is always the most important. Uh, training your telecommunicators, ensuring that you have access to the proper information, and having standard operating procedures. Train your staff, SOP and then do your QA evaluation as well, but also educate your third-party service providers about emergency services so that what they are promising and what they are selling really is the right thing and the right way to work with 112, 911, emergency response. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. <laughs> so before we begin, maybe we have one question or two. Anybody? No questions. Uh, then I, I would like just to take one minute and ask a very uh, <clears throat> fast thing. So the, I was interested in the topic about uh, the impact on call takers, right? And in my history, I've seen that sometimes uh, agencies are a little bit uh, skeptical in getting so much data because it changes the procedures they are working in, mm -hmm. in a positive way, of course, but still it's a change. So from your experience, uh, did you also have the same, like uh, a little bit of initial skeptical approach? Uh, how long did it take before they realized the importance of getting rich data? You know, you're absolutely right. There's always a hesitation to changing a workflow and changing what I do with my job. But as soon as that telecommunicator has their first save and their win, and they understand how that data is utilized, they start to spread the word to their peers as well. Um, from the agency perspective, sometimes when we're in management, and I was in management for a long time, we think we know what's best for that telecommunicator. But when you actually talk to those frontline telecommunicators, they want access to more data. They want video and they want other tools because they know that it's going to help them do their job so much better. So really understanding what the frontline needs and how that data is utilized it will make a difference, but that awareness comes where it does take a little bit of time mm -hmm. to show them, uh, show them the way, show them the data, and have those safe stories. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are ready for the second presentation. Ronnie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, hello and servus from Austria. My name is Ronnie. I'm the head of one of our comm centers. And speaking, presenting in English as the native speaker, it's going to get a hard one, yeah. Um, yeah, gonna try and hard not to increase your fatigue after this lunch. Um, let me introduce you some quick facts and figures about our company to let you scale up or down to your company if we have the same mission and to see you, you can calculate your numbers if you have the same issues or things. Yeah, we're called Notruf Niederösterreich. We are the medical college center and dispatch center for Lower Austria. We, have a, we are a liabil, uh, limited, limited liability company with various shareholders, but primary government owned by the country of Lower Austria. Um, of course, we are multi-certified, uh, which makes us think we're, and, and we're pretty convinced to do our things right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, whereas Lower Austria, we are located in the northeastern part of Austria. 
and operating, serving about 1.7 1 million people. Um, as you can see, Vienna is surrounded by Lower Austria, so a lot of commuters too. And from rural to urban uh, locations, a lot of state borders to Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, Slovak Republic, and of course, the access to Vienna. Um, these are basically all dispatched units, just to have a, f a few pictures for you, so you can scale it up or down, yeah. Um, a few numbers to our emergency, emergency medical uh, telephone situation. That's the average pickup time is about four seconds. The time to dispatch is about one, min one minute. Uh, two minutes is the average call duration, and the arrival time is owed to the very rural sections of Lower Austria. So it's uh, just an average number here, yeah. Uh, we're handling about nine million calls a year and contacts via various web services, which will you see afterwards. Um, this results in about 1.5 million dispatched events through our CAT system. Um, about 250,000 of these are time-critical emergency events. Yeah, we operate one control center on four different locations for redundancy reasons and have various partners and third-party service providers, as you see here. So this was just a quick introduction so you can make your own numbers and know what's about when we're talking about web services for the third-party service providers. Yeah, let me put one thing first. In a perfect world, we all know it, these guys would all be using a CAT system and there would be an interface between you and their CAT, their CAT system and your CAT system and you don't have to waste a thought about getting informations from them. Yeah, SOS buttons. I guess every EMS provider will know them. They are blessing and curse in one. A lot of false alarms and a lot of call handling to do with them. Yeah, all sorts to that. What's the challenge? Um, in Law Austria, we have a lot, uh, we have various providers and they have their own business model from really big providers to very small providers, selling them to people. And for the population of Law Austria, this results in about 50 events per day, which makes last year were about 17,000 events. Um, problem with these things is there are complex on-site entry scenarios. So you come into a house, don't know where the key safe is, or the key is hidden behind the stone or something like that. Various strange situations to get there. Yeah? Um, the patients do have a well-known medical history in the most case, cases, and if you get a call from a third-party service provider concerning an SOS button, it always ends up in sending and on dispatching an emergency medical unit. So a post-triage to an EMD is rarely needed in these cases. And it's a rapidly expanding uh, segment of the market. Yeah, our approach to this was we had a lot of calls. We just made the providers a website. And let me introduce you how it looks in our cases. Um, here you see basic information for the patient. It's the social security number. If that's not available, you can put it here. But these are mandatory fields. So it's a really, really simple interface tailored to the needs uh, of the third party service provider stuff. And here you see, for example, this the, he has to enter the address and additional information to the scene. Um, it's, it's a really simple interface and uh, it has to work with the worst possible equipment on the market. Um, we have seen uh, Internet, Internet uh, Explorer, about 15 years old, uh, accessing our system. So you have it take it very low level and therefore it's not so visually appealing for the eye. Um, yeah. For example, you have to keep it for their stuff to be easy accessible. You don't know how their stuff is, uh, what, what are their skills, yeah? And so keep it simple. We made some pictograms for them just to say, okay, it was fell, we have no contact, 
uh, someone is in a bad condition, so he has their stuff has just take to click on a button and things are done. This goes directly into a CAD system, and here are the benefits what we had from getting them to a web service from a standard call. There's absolutely no information loss between two people talking about a case, of course. There's the simultaneous processing for the third party service provider who has the client on the phone and doesn't have to call in the emergency call center, just entered his, enter, enters the information on his computer. Of course, there's zero response time as he does this on the same time. And this saves us in staffing about 600 hours of talk time, which makes about 8,000 euros a year. You pay less for personnel and uh, in, in terms of staff shortage, which is a big problem nowadays, you save your precious resources for their primar primary designated work. <clears throat> there also is a possibility to make an event follow up for the third party service provider, so they don't have to call you again and, and check up if the client has been left on the scene because it was a false alarm or has been transported to a hospital or something like that. They can do it online, they won't end up in your system again and doing another call. Yeah, next example, hospitals and nursing homes. In our case, in Lower Austria, we are in the situation as only one big provider. Um, it's a government. <laughs> They're operating 27 hospitals, a lot of nursing homes. And yeah, you heard we are government owned, they are government owned, and guess what? Do we have access to our databases? Of course not. So we built them a web page. Um, there's no standardized notification via phone when they're ordering an ambulance. So there's no standard SUB inside these houses. Um, just a second. Yeah, they end up about 800 events a day which are transferred into our systems. And what a big issue is there's no formal protocol for reimbursement if something went wrong, if the patient is transferred to a wrong place or isn't insured, or something like that. And it's, of course, rapidly expanding. Yeah, here you see a live, in, in real time, what it looks like for the hospital to enter the information in our CAT system. In this case, you see there's a real time check of the social security number if there's insurance for the patient and he's clearly identified through the social security number. Um, this is a patient with no prior record in our system. So if the patient is known and you have saved some data, it's of course quite, quite faster than this. Personal ordering a transport also sees what, what's going to cost. And yeah, that's it. Every field is mandatory, so there's no information loss. In this case, you see, is, case, is this a, is this the COVID case? Should there be any, any, um, any special procedures needed, special hygienic measures? Is the is assistance necessary at the patient, and so on? Yeah, and that's it. The benefits in this case are much wider. Uh, as I mentioned before, the patient is clearly identified through security, social security number. Um, the client ordering the transport is also clearly identified. Uh, it's, we call it the Mr. Smith problem in, in Germany and Austria. It's Huber or Meyer. And if you try to call Mrs. Huber or Meyer in an, in an, in an uh, uh, in a hospital, uh, you're you, you surely won't reach her ever again. Yeah? Um, of course, same like for the other provider, you have a follow-up for the hospital staff, is where's the ambulance I called, um, does it take any longer to get there, and so on. And it saves about 7,000 hours of talk time, which is about the full-time equivalency, equivalency of uh, four employees, and this saves about 110,000 euros a year for a company. Third example is Vienna International Airport. Um, 
Yeah, Vienna, Vienna International Airport is located in Lower Austria, so that's the real important thing. <laughs> Serving about 30 million passengers a day, uh, a year, and you see the facts and figures. And they do have a proprietary medical service on their own site, and highly specialized ter terminology in aviation, and have some mayday procedures, of course, and about 2,000 transfers to hospitals a year from the airport. Of course, they have a high demand for an uninterrupted service because this is big money if there is a delay or interruption of service there. In this case, they do have another, uh, term, uh, another access into our system. Um, in this case, it's for example, return landings or major severe incidents that could happen. And it's like Amazon for ambulances. They just tip one case and they get an ambulance or three helicopters or 200 ambulances <laughs> like that, yeah. Here you see in case of uh, mass casual casualties, uh, that's the form, the dispatcher on scene at the airport just has to choose what, how many passengers on board of a plane. Um, any additional information, flight number, what's the current situation of the plane. And with the click of a button, it goes into a CAT system and there are clearly defined procedures, what he will get in which case. And there are no barriers in their used specific terminology. If they call you your EMD, that's the problem. They have a very special terminology. You have another, and so it's clearly defined. If that and that happens, you get that service. Same here. They call it unlawful act at the airport. From hijacking to bomb threat to terrorist attack, and it's all tailor-made. That's one thing. It has to be tailor-made because if that doesn't suit their needs, they will so they will end up calling you, even if you have built them their own web services. So it has to suit their needs and they should be happy with that. Yeah, the benefits, like I mentioned before, no information loss. You can retrieve predefined scenarios and every information you need is provided, of course. And it saves talk time, like before. Yeah. Some other examples, I guess time's running out. If you're interested in, in, I can show you afterwards. It's a real interesting project with the company Nordstern uh, for patients with very, very rare medical conditions. You can store the data directly in the CAD system. If an EMT arrives on the scene, he can access this information directly and so on, but I can show you afterwards. Even here to e-call providers which are not directly linked to the CAD system the same way tailor-made systems. Yeah, this was a quick brief overview of our systems and our access of web services for third-party service providers. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we have a couple of minutes for some questions from the audience. Any question? Okay, so um, actually I would like to hear your opinion on something, Ronnie. Um, in your presentation, and in, not only in your presentation, I've seen a lot of examples of companies with uh, good intentions of providing services to public services. But my, 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 my question, so is, don't you feel that sometimes uh, uh, there is less interaction before releasing these things? It's like, the good intentions are kept inside the companies and they do not relate 100% with the needs of the public services. Is there enough interaction before releasing these services or you just get what, what they give you, something like that? <laughs> because there's a, so much, there are so much third-party service providers, um, we, this was the only possibility to, to handle their massive calls and to, to do... To, to, to tighten our operations. And um, we showed them the systems, of course, and showed them, okay, that's, 
you can call, of course. You, you, can't, you can't interrupt them from calling your system and getting, uh, getting your own phone. But we show them the systems. And because of the benefits of, of following up the events or, or these things, uh, they like to use the system. So okay. they saw it as a big advantage in, in case of uh, otherwise calling and calling again and asking, has the patient been transported and what's the waiting time and so on. So it's a big benefit for them also, yeah. Yeah, because coordinating this uh, huge amount of data, diverse in its nature and so on, becomes complex unless you propose some way of, you know, some, some PSAPs, for example, decide simply to say, look, there, it's too much. We are not obliged to take this data, so we, we, we'd rather, you know, do without it than, you know, complicate too much the, the procedures of our... Yeah. Well, it's the situation, the legal situation also is you, you can't... If they call you, you have to handle the yeah. call. Yeah? And, and if you're the gatekeeper to the medical system, to the preclinical medical system, you have no choice than serving them. Mm -hmm. And it's the best way you can get them into a direction of not, not uh, clogging your, your lines, yeah. yeah. Okay. One final question. Who's your CAD provider, by the way? No, sorry, I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get ready for the final presentation. Anna, the floor is yours. All right, so hello, and thanks for still listening to this last presentation. So we've heard a couple of solutions, how to get the TPS data into the PSAPs, and now I would like to share my or our experience with you being, yeah, let's say one of the biggest TPS e-call providers. So before I do that, just a really quick glance about Bosch. No, you don't have to learn this by heart, just to know we're a lot of people, more than 400,000 worldwide, and most of our business we actually do with mobility services. This is, of course, also components, but we also do the, the services. So it's clear we have a really close relations to the automotive manufacturers. Um, this is also reflected um, in our services when we're really talking about the e-call. We do this globally. Whenever we look at the e-call, we do not mean this in contrast to the 112 e-call, but to the e-call possibility in general, wherever you can be in the world. So by now we have more than 30 million vehicles connected actually. It will be 40 millions um, during the next upcoming two years. So this is quite a lot. And um, yeah, why do I tell you all this? This also shows you like the global setup. We have uh, various um, departments all over the world. We have of course all languages that you need. Um, and why we do this, okay, sorry, this is the Bosch e-call just real quick. Of course, we handle 100% of the e-calls and there's a number missing. We do this um, well below the 10%, uh, 10 seconds that is um, demanded, but most of the time, I think 95% we handle within three seconds, which is really short. And um, it's a bunch of e-calls, more than two and a half millions per year but we only have 128,000 rescue interventions. And this also shows, you know, the, we had the mentioning of false alarms. You never hear from us because we only call you when we really have something going on, right? So a lot of traffic is taken away from you because we do this, right? So, okay, why did I all tell that? I just want to make um, clear that the, the e-call designed from Bosch is a holistic product, meaning it starts with the, car, with the car, it goes to the back end of the OEM, it goes to our back end, and we have the MNOs on board. So we don't have the problem like you don't have the net coverage or just parts is coming through, or like parts of the number is not transmitted, you cannot call back the, VIN num uh, the, number of the SIM number of the card because everything belongs together, right? So the, the, our OEM customers, they buy the SIM cards, they test it with the system, so it's an end-to-end -end thing. So it's something PSAPs can dream of, I know, yeah, because you have regulations you have to follow, but then you don't have the telecommunications authorities that go within, so this product really is a holistic service. Um, we do, of course, also continuous end-to-end -end testing. We do this all over the world, make sure that um, if cars are imported to other countries where they're never supposed to be, it will still work and so on. 
Um, and we do, of course, also the um, con continuous development of the service. If, is there more data needed or is it enough if you would just pass it on verbally? Do you need any more information if it's an electric vehicle, how you can like cut it open or whatever? And most important also, we have the people that are doing the service are only doing e-calls. They don't have any other 112 calls, right? They do this all the time, which means they fairly well know when it is a real e-call. So they really do their job very well when it comes to filtering, okay? Um, so we started this service actually 10 years ago, more than 10 years now. Um, six years before, actually, we had this whole discussion about the 112 e-call versus TPS e-call because there was only TPS e-call. So we have been on the market for quite a fair time before 112 started, knowing that the EU e-call standards would come up. So, of course, we adhered to them from the very beginning. And since we only transmitted 5 to 10% of the real calls, PSAPs got notification of us, but sometimes didn't really know what that actually means. And because they all get it verbally, okay, they got notification, there's an accident, where it is, it was fine, but there was not a big discussion going on. And also, of course, um, we started with the MSD, like, okay, what kind of interface could we have? There were some pilots going on, and in the end, I will come to back that in a minute, it's, uh, it is inbound because now this is installed in all of the PSAPs. So we have a couple of APIs in Europe, but most of the time we do this via inbound. So, but the coexistence with the 112 e-call, um, we can see since like two years, PSAPs get more and more e-calls. They realize more and more, okay, this is really like 90% false alarm and it sucks sometimes. Um, and sometimes they don't get the data or corrupt data and then you know, they should maybe do the differentiation between manual and automatic e-calls because manual e-calls have a much higher false alarm rate. And some PSAPs didn't know that before and they installed instruments to see that actually, so to adjust their call handling. Um, things we actually know, we can tell <laughs> if you ask. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, also, the, of course, you don't get an extended set of information. You don't know what kind of airbags have been deployed, if there has been a rollover and so on. But works both fine. And what is our experience with the PSAPs? I have to say it's, um, it covers the whole range from very good collaboration, really a nice like friendly exchange, like what can we do to improve the service? Not only the e-call, our TPS e-call, but also the e-call, the 112 e-call. Because when they test with us, they learn stuff, right? Because they can also learn about the 112, as I said, the differentiation that manual equals might need a different approach than the automatic equals and so on. So then we have also the complete rejection. We have cases where the PSAPs say, no, we don't want you. You have to switch to the 112. And um, most of the time, since we still call, they say, yeah, but you won't get access and I won't let you send your MSD which is very unfortunate because it saves time, especially when you have the GPS position and it's like a remote area, you're not in the street address range or something. So yeah, um, unfortunate. I hope it will change. And um, yeah, as I said, we do the testing and we of course can do this also for the 112. Um, and it is saving time and we don't, we will still call you and give valuable information that you might need to do the right rescue dispatch, but this doesn't save that much time. Like the car has rolled over three times. That took like, what, two seconds to say? So it's really an improvement, just focusing on the MSD, transmitting it, and then having everything else verbally. So I mentioned it, what we're doing, we have a range of um, methods how to send the data into the PSAP. We are actually waiting for NG112 to take place. And I, um, I mean, when I listen to the presentations with Slan Macedonia, I'm really looking forward, but then I'm always like, hey, where is our entrance to your next generation platform? Stand of today, we can do it, right? We have next generation. But please think of us because we're still out there and you cannot ignore like 30 million vehicles, okay? So, this is my <laughs> wish <laughs> for the next generation. But as of today, we do the inbound router. We do it mostly through Europe. Just to give you a quick overview, 
Two of these countries, I can say it's Austrian Czech Republic, will be green soon. So we cover really 100% of the PSEPs there, serving the, inbound, the, the MSD inbound solution. And um, yeah, maybe what's like the, the gist of the whole thing. Um, try to work with us. We have a highly professional product. It really makes sense also to learn from that. We don't underlie constraints that public might have because we can design this end-to-end -end product. We have all the newest technologies. We can even help to downgrade stuff, right? Give an inbound as an example. Who would use inbound actually in nowadays standards? But we can do it. And once you know, 2G, 3G sunset is taking place, sorry, but inbound won't work anymore. You can still use it with us because we are going over the landline. So maybe you want to keep you know, all the stuff that you bought for a lot of money. This is just one thing you know, where I asked you to think about. Um, yeah, it will benefit in the end the person that's in the car. That was quick, huh? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, as a conclusion to our session, any questions from the audience? No questions? Yeah, there is one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Good afternoon. Mario from DEC Unify Portugal. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm very curious. You mentioned that you have 30 million uh, cars uh, registered in your system and uh, looking for the news about the sunset for 2G and 3G. Uh, what is your plan to help the owners of the cars that are paying for the service for the next five years? Well, okay, two things to that. Our service is free of charge. It's the automotive manufacturer that pays for it and not the customer. So they don't have to worry about. And the second thing is we're not affected by the sunset. Because as I said, the, this product is designed end to end. It will work after the sunset. So that's a nice thing. Sorry to insist. How do we intend to transmit the e-call to your service yes. without a 2G and 3G network? Yes, we don't need it. Yeah. You don't can, need it? No, we can switch to 4G, 3, 5G. But yeah. how? The car doesn't have a modem for 4G. No, but we also have SMS as fallback, for example, with the legacy models that came into existence before the e-call legislation. So we will, in any matter, we will receive the MSD. So you make a new standard. It's, it's not a standard, it's the TPA. Okay. I mean, that's, you Thank know. you very much. All right, so one final, <clears throat> also so some, some final words from my side. I've been working on e-call and TPS for, for several years. So first of all, Congratulations for finding a good solution in general. Sometimes the easiest way to do it is the best, right? Uh, TPS have been struggling for a long time to understand, oh my God, how can we deliver data to, to pieces? And the second is, I, I saw the slide about the relationship with PSAPs and so on. And again, a few years ago, the other struggle of TPS providers was how we deal with PSAPs. Now, um, have you ever find a situation where uh, you could escalate to a higher level by instead of knocking at every piece of door, just going to a higher entity or agency saying, let's use this strategy or call or collaborate at a higher level so that multiple piece ups may be involved at the same time. Or is it still like knocking at every door? Well, it very much depends on the structure of the country. I'm mm -hmm. speaking for Europe now. Of course, my like the best thing is if you have like a ministry that is that oversees all PSAPs, they all have the same system. I dream about that in Germany, right? Yeah. <laughs> It'll, it's never going to happen, so don't worry. <laughs> but um, yeah, of course, we try. We try it on different levels. We speak to the PSAPs really in person, trying to convince them because in the end, it's the call handlers that get the problem, mm -hmm. right? They get the call from us and then they don't have the data. So what's the point? You know, we can do yeah. it. Yeah. But okay. ministry takes time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if there is no other question, this is the end of the session. Uh, just a final note on what's happening next. next. So we have four more sessions coming. Uh, Lean Hart Hall, uh, additional data in emergency communication management. Kosovo Hall, emergency communication handling around the world. 
Sti Hall uh, Masterclass Artificial Intelligence and Chatbots. And here in this room, we are having next generation e call, where I'm going to swap my hat and become a presenter. Just in case, uh, Anna, maybe you will see something interesting because I'm talking about TPS SQL as well. Just in case. Um, I would like to invite Christina to come on the stage, who is moderating the next session. And thank you, everyone, for attending. So the session is over. Like the priest says, you may go. <laughs> <laughs>